Welcome to the second annual Think Big, Be Bold milestone celebration. My name is Peter Bonham-Smith and I am the Dean of the College of Arts and Science and a Professor of Biology. Due to the global pandemic and the restrictions imposed by COVID-19, we're not able to gather in person, but I thank you for joining us here virtually today. We are all arts and science students, faculty and staff still together while staying safely apart. While some of us are in Saskatoon, many are in other cities, provinces, countries and different time zones. A very warm welcome to all of you, wherever you are currently residing. It has been a very challenging pandemic year. I want to acknowledge the collective trauma and grief that people have experienced. We have been through a lot. We won't be going back to the way it was and we don't know exactly what the future will bring and that can be unsettling. But there are opportunities for students and faculty to learn, to teach, to research in different ways. The pandemic has prompted us to discover different and new ways to think big and be bold. When I look back on what the college has achieved over the past year, I know that there are accomplishments we can celebrate today, and it is important to celebrate them. Adversity has met resilience. So please, Join me as we watch highlights of success in and impact on two of our college plan commitments, Students First and New Curricula. Thank you all for being part of our story. Hello everyone, I'm Dr. Stephen Ryan, a faculty member in Mathematics and Statistics and a member of the College of Arts and Science Planning Advisory Committee. On behalf of the college and the committee, I want to extend a very warm welcome to you as you join us today for our Think Big, Be Bold College Plan Milestone Celebration. Before we begin, I would like to acknowledge that we are on Treaty 6 territory and the homeland of the Métis. We pay respect to the First Nations and Métis ancestors of this place and reaffirm our relationship to one another. One of the college plan pillars being celebrated this year is implementing new curricula. In support of this pillar, we have assembled an expert panel around the theme of curriculum in the college past, present, and future. We're inescapably aware that, as part of the present and future, the ongoing pandemic is causing us to rethink many aspects of curriculum and course design. And we hope to get some insight into this during the discussions. Now, it's very exciting that we have three distinguished dynamic scholars from the college with us today. We have Dr. Simone Harvitz. A past Rhodes Scholar, Dr. Harvitz is an associate professor in our college's Department of History, where her research and teaching focus on African history and history of medicine. She's been the recipient of two Provost Teaching Awards and two USSU Teaching Excellence Awards. And last year received the George Ivany Award for internationalization. Dr. Horvitz is passionate about inclusive pedagogy and works towards a classroom, which is both a safe and productive space for all students. We also have Prof Dean McNeil with us. A trumpet player and composer, Prof McNeil is head of the Department of Music, where he's been a professor of brass and jazz for 24 years. He is currently Artistic Director of the Saskatoon Jazz Orchestra and a member of the Saskatoon Symphony Orchestra. Having commissioned many new musical works, Dean has been involved in a variety of interdisciplinary artistic projects on and off our campus and has judged many high profile music competitions, both regionally and nationally. Amongst his lengthy list of awards are both the USSU Teaching Excellence Award and the Department of Music's Dwayne Nelson Teaching Award. And last but not least, we have Dr. Chris Todd. Dr. Todd is a professor and head of the Department of Biology. He is a plant molecular biologist with an active research program fo uh, focusing on molecular mechanisms driving plant responses to biotic and abiotic stresses. Over his career, he has worked to integrate research into his undergraduate teaching. A winner of the College's Distinguished Teacher Award and the Provost Award for Outstanding Innovation and Learning, Dr. Todd is currently interested in increasing course-based undergraduate research and incorporating undergraduate publishing into his classes. Now that we know who our panelists are, I want to get underway with a question for them. Our first question is, what do you feel has been the most innovative aspect of your course design or delivery prior to the pandemic? I'll begin with Simone. Thank you very much. I'll focus on two things briefly. And the first is my study abroad to South Africa. And the second is my inclusive pedagogy. So from the time I arrived here, I had was desperately trying to find a way to take students from Saskatchewan and expose them to a broader worldview and to allow them to move outside of their comfort zones to have experiential learning. 
And I set up a six week study abroad program in South Africa, which I've been running every two or three years. We were supposed to go this year when the pandemic hit and we were grounded. Um, and students spend six weeks learning in South Africa, doing courses, um, meeting people from all different backgrounds, traveling to different places. And it really opens their eyes in a way that nothing on the, on the campus here could, could do. And so I've been very proud of that. And then secondly, as you said in my bio, the inclusive classroom is something that is really important to me. And I developed a, um, developed a handout for students for the beginning of term where I asked them about their gendered pronouns, what pronouns they prefer, what name they prefer. And I feel that that's very important because it signals not only to the students who are, are gender variant, but to all students that this is a safe space. And I work in my class to create a space that is racially, um, racially gendered religious uh, tolerance at the center. I encourage parents that or caregivers to bring children or those that they are caring for into the classroom if they need to. And we work around them. We, and of course that's changed all with, with COVID. But to create that space where everybody feels inclusive and everybody can learn is a huge way of making a learning environment that is good for everybody. And then to be able to take that a step further and take some students, usually 10 at a time, uh, to South Africa has been what I'm most proud of in my curriculum innovation. Thanks so much, uh, Simone and uh, Dean. Well, there's a number of things that we're very proud of in our department. We have many connections to the uh, community pre-university and post-university. Ours is a very integrated uh, experience for our students. Um, most recently, we've figured out a way for string majors in our department to be able to play in the Saskatoon Symphony Orchestra, which is a prof fully professional organization and receive university credit for it. And we have many different um, ways of co connecting and, and uh, reaching out to the, to the community to support what's going on uh, culturally and uh, musically in the schools. The fine arts are perhaps uh, somewhat unique in the sense that we are, are, are always very sensitive to what's going on in the community because we are so profoundly connected to our community and, and vice versa. So when the pandemic hit, it, we really had to rethink what we did because we are literally in the business of bringing people shoulder to shoulder on stage and, and in the audience together. So it was a real challenge for us and maybe we'll address that in, in the next uh, uh, round of questions. But in particular, yeah, one thing that I, I think that is just so um, unique about what we do here is how connected we are, you know, from everything from uh, the symphony to the, we run music uh, uh, workshops here, music programs in the summer. Uh, we have our faculty going out and connecting with uh, people in the community, getting pieces of uh, music jointly run. There's connections between the Saskatoon Jazz Orchestra and our university. Um, so it's a very, very busy place. And um, it's, a, it's a place that is welcomed, uh, or that, that is a very welcoming place as well. That's wonderful. Uh, thanks for sharing that, Dean. And Chris? Thanks, Stephen. Um, I think for me, it, it speaks a little bit to uh, what we were talking about in the bio, uh, blending and blurring the line between uh, research and teaching. And so one of the things I'm, I'm most proud of is a fourth year functional genomics class that I, I've been offering. Um, it's a lab-based course where we, uh, we take senior students and we connect them to large uh, publicly available data sets. Um, and then we teach them how to work with this data and then also to, how to break it down into manageable bits uh, so that they can actually design hypotheses and uh, experiments and, and test them at the, the bench. So this is going from tens of thousands of genes down to something that they can accomplish uh, over a series of weeks. Um, it's always lots of fun to be in, in the lab with the students. And what I was really looking forward to this year is that in the past, that's typically been a uh, an individual based project where students are working in parallel um, and really trying to integrate some group work and try and get the students all moving together in the same direction on a, a project and developing that set of skills as well. Thanks so much, Chris. It's great to hear about. So then for our next question, I'd like to ask, what has been the most innovative aspect of your course design or delivery during the pandemic? And Chris, we'll start with you this time. 
Thanks. I think before I, I talk about anything I've done in my course, I'm going to uh, promote one, some of the work of some of my colleagues. And I think it just points to the fact that during the pandemic, there's been no one right way to do anything. So I've been really impressed with one of our very large uh, physiology classes, uh, over 200, 300 students a term, where uh, my colleagues were able to figure out a way for students to come to campus and get electronic equipment they could bring home, hook up to their laptops and hook themselves up and record physiological data and use that as a real hands-on learning experience um, as, a, as a member of a group and then bring that back to campus, get a sanitized turnaround and, and to another student for, for the next week. And they've been doing this since uh, since September. It's been a fabulous job. Uh, for me, we I couldn't send the whole molecular biology lab home with the students. So that wasn't gonna happen. And so we transitioned to a, you know, a sort of a traditional, um, you know, a current topics seminar based class. But what I did uh, this term is I took all the reins off and I let it be uh, student led and group centric and i think uh, at the beginning uh, there was a little bit of uncomfortableness with that as sort of the parameters were taken off and students had to to find their feet but uh, by this point in the term uh, all i can say is it's gone outstanding i've been incredibly impressed by the work they've been able to uh, develop and honestly it's really the best part of my week well that's fantastic to hear thanks chris uh simone uh what about you uh what uh which innovations have been spurred for you by the pandemic? I'm undergrad director in the Department of History. So we had to quickly pivot. And I think what I'm most proud of, three things. The first is the department itself and how our department managed to get half of our courses synchronous and half of our courses asynchronous so that we could um, appeal to both groups of students. And we were able to put together very quickly a brochure of, um, of how our courses would be run. And my colleagues have done amazing things in keeping the courses um, running. For myself, my innovation was to make the online course look as much like an in-class course as possible. And so I have uh, periods of time before and after class when we would all stand around and talk. Um, I try to mirror as much in my seminars of the class as possible. I try to do the same kind of group work where I pop in and out. And so to try and give the students some sense. And I think that that's been really important. And I also, it's my favorite time of the week is talking to the students because for many of them, it's the only time they talk to human beings. And then finally, um, Erica Dick, um, also in the history department and um, Scott Napper from medicine, and have put together a course on viruses and immunology and pandemics. And we had the course in the back of our minds before the pandemic broke out. But when the pandemic um, hit, we actually started teaching the course. And so it's the first time we've had an interdisciplinary course taught by the sciences and by um, historians. We have half of the class scientists and half of the class are, um, and half the class are historians. And we are doing group projects where they are looking at diseases in different contexts and working through it. And I think it's been a wonderful way of learning from one another. Thanks, Simone. And that interdisciplinary aspect definitely sounds very exciting. Um, Dean, how about you? Well, um, as you can imagine, the music department is in the business of doing things. And when the pandemic hit, we really were scratching our heads. Um, my department has, has um, done amazing things over the uh, spring and, and uh, fall and into the uh, uh, new year here. One of the things that we did is we created a weekly gathering session of our department to bring together people in community and to share new ideas. We've had talks on wellness for musicians. We've had an extended fine arts research lecture series where we've had some terrific speakers. We started a faculty and friends concert series with the idea that examples often make the best teachers. So we were able to uh, still have faculty and, and people in the community perform for our students and have discussion sessions about that. Uh, in the fall, all of our courses, except for some of our applied lessons, were offered online, and that was a real challenge for us. And in the spring, uh, and I, I do have to say how much I very much appreciate the support of the pandemic response team and our college administration, who worked very, very hard with our department to allow certain things to come back onto campus, applied lessons, uh, uh, ensembles, although people could still participate in ensembles virtually, uh, and a few class uh, uh, performance-based classes and 
We figured out a way to live stream our third and fourth year in graduate recitals. So these are, are where the students performing in, you know, in Convocation Hall, but there's no audience. Um, all of these things uh, took technical challenges. They, uh, they really required a lot of, of people. A lot of, uh, a lot of the aspect of our department is, is in normal times quite iterative where people are doing things <clears throat> and you're assessing them and discussing them and responding to them very, very quickly. The most obvious example is a jazz improvisation class that I teach. So with latency, uh, you cannot perform in real time with people. So we had to work at, at different ways of figuring, figuring out uh, ways of still um, getting people to be reactive uh, and responsive and emotive with music, but at the same time, realize that there are certain limitations to the technology that we simply had to acknowledge, kind of like Chris's point that you, you can't just send the whole group home with a biology lab. So it was, um, <clears throat> it's been an interesting time. Um, uh, people have really uh, d done an exceptional job. The other thing that we did is we created a quite a comprehensive newsletter. We've done two versions of that, partially to remind our students and again, the community of who we are, what we are, why we do what we do, how we do what we do, but to also <clears throat> provide opportunities or a platform to share new things. There's been a lot of uh, uh, our ensembles creating these these virtual videos where everyone is and, and audio where people are are uh, going online and mounting their individual part to a piece of music. Um, and then we'll have that mixed down and then sharing it with the group. And all of that is in our uh, spring 2020 newsletter and our winter 2021 newsletter. Um, <clears throat> so it's been an interesting time. Some, uh, some things actually have, have come out um, of this in, even, uh, in an even more strong way, which I had not predicted. For example, so, <clears throat> excuse me, some of our courses where students are required to perform in real time uh, certain assignments, well, we can't do that. So they were having to submit uh, videotapes of them performing. And what invariably happens, instead of just performing once and having it be done, you record it, you watch it, you learn something, you re-record it again. <clears throat> so again, uh, we didn't have the iterative process between the performer and other members, but people kind of had self iterative processes. So one thing I noticed in the jazz improvisation class uh, last spring is through going this, this process of submitting things electronically, uh, video and audio recording is actually the quality of the final product. We had a bit of a bump there in a positive trajectory in ways that I would not have anticipated. Well, thanks, Dean. And uh, it's especially good to know um, that the college and the pandemic recovery team uh, were able to help uh, music with the, uh, the technical uh, challenges of, uh, of you know, bringing to life in, in this kind of climate the, uh, the communal and collaborative nature of music and, and musical instruction. They worked very, very hard at this because um, we really did of course, our number one priority was keeping everyone as safe as possible, but they really heard what our specific needs were. And I would imagine our needs were, were uh, much more significant than most, if not all the other departments in our college. So yeah, they, they really did work very hard and, and we really appreciate it because much of what we do just does not work uh, in a traditional way during the pandemic. Thanks, Dean. Um, and the last question I have for the three of you is, is the one about the future. So what do you want to try in the future? And what will you keep or discard uh, after the pandemic? And I'll begin with you, Dean. Well, one of the things that we noticed when we were bringing guest lectures in, and uh, this is an interesting time because uh, we were all sitting at home and a lot of the people who are often jet setting around the world as international level uh, artists were also sitting at home. So uh, the, the quality of people that we were able to bring in for our guest lecture series was absolutely incredible. And of course, uh, we didn't spend any money on transportation, meal per diems, hotels. That's where usually the money gets eaten up uh, with these sorts of projects. So I would imagine in the future, we're going to have a lot more of a hybrid blend between in-person guest artists and lectures, uh, uh, recitals by our students, I think we're going to be streaming uh, recitals from now on. 
we've we've set up a system so that uh, our ensembles can also stream uh, their rehearsals and their concerts out to the greater community in exciting kinds of ways. Uh, we are looking forward to getting back in person in, in lots of ways, but we've got an enormous amount done again in our, our most recent newsletter. There's a, an entire page of our curricular revisions, which we have worked through. Again, our faculty was sequestered at home, so we were able to get a lot done in our curricular revision area. And uh, there are definitely some advantages uh, to uh, working in uh, virtual kinds of ways, and we'll continue to explore those. It's kind of funny to say this, but uh, one thing I've noticed is that when you're in a classroom, it's, it's kind of hard to uh, direct students' attention sometimes, but on a, in a virtual call, you can literally point your pointer and point at this note and say, check this out. So um, there are, have been some advantages uh, uh, that I would not have seen um, uh, because of COVID, you know. So uh, it's been an interesting time. And uh, I, I think that we're all, uh, COVID, uh, post-COVID is not going to look like pre-COVID in all kinds of ways. And, and there will be some disadvantages, but we've learned some really valuable lessons through going through the shared experience. And uh, I think that, um, I think that a lot of good is going to come of it. One small issue is that we've been commissioning a lot of works because again, composers have been sitting at home and we've kind of been stockpiling repertoire in all of our ensembles that we're very excited to start getting at. Uh, so I think in general, we're going to see kind of an explosion of artistic um, uh, outputs by our performing and composing community. This is very common when it comes to adversity, when, when humans are in adverse conditions afterwards, there's almost invariably an explosion of, uh, of uh, really interesting art. So I'm looking forward to that. That's fascinating. Thanks, Dean. And uh, Chris, please. Well, I have to say I'm, I'm really looking forward to getting back to the laboratory. Um, you know, there's, there's some things that, that don't translate and because, uh, because we do a lot of experimentation, quite often it doesn't work. Um, and usually the, there's you know as much or more learning that gets done in the troubleshooting and, and figuring that out than uh, than gets done if, if it goes right the first time. Um, but in terms of of what I want to take forward, I think uh, continuing with the uh, the group dynamics and uh, seeing how that translates to in person, that's something I'm really looking forward to doing uh, as we get back to uh, in person and and also loosening the reins a little bit and just sort of providing that sense of freedom um, and that sense of agency and you know, students deciding where to take the, these projects and, and how to set them up um, and how they want to do it. So those are some of the things that from the, the pandemic that I'm, I'm looking to take forward. Um, and then I also think there's, there's some low hanging fruit that uh, uh, is there. You know, I, I used to always take it for granted that if we wanted to talk about uh, difficult concepts of uh, genetics or molecular biology, we almost certainly had to get together in my office because um, I've never seen with my naked eyes anything I've ever looked on. It's always been graphical representations and cartoons and uh, it's usually sitting across the desk with a, a set of legal paper and, and just drawing it out and trying to explain um, abstract concepts um, on paper. And, um, you know, we don't need to do that anymore. I think uh, I'm by uh, no means a, a Picasso on the whiteboard with some of these uh, virtual meeting tools but you know i think that ability to meet students uh around the world uh not just in my office is going to be something uh, that i take forward and, and and doing that with the graduate students doing that with colleagues i think just the way we interact is going to be different moving forward thanks chris uh and i can say that uh you know i agree with you as, as a mathematician I've been exposed in, in the last 12 months to all sorts of tools for, uh, for visualization and, and uh, you know, describing uh, abstract mathematical concepts that, uh, that I, I you know, never knew were out there. So it's, it's definitely an interesting time for that. And, uh, and Simone, um, how about you? You have the last word. Thank you. I was talking to my students um, in my class yesterday, uh, the other day, and I said to them, what, what should we keep from this? And they jokingly said nothing, we should go back to how it was. And I laughed and I felt the same way. I, there are things that 
um, I think there are benefits, but most of my students and most of the faculty are very keen to get back into the classroom and to keep that what we what we do what and what we do best, which is communicating and being together. As a department, we have thought very much about the fact that that the pandemic and the online courses allowed access to some students who couldn't have had access before. And so while some of us are desperate to get back into the classroom, we also recognize that this has actually been a great opportunity to expand the, the um, offerings and to expand who can have access to the courses. So we will be continuing to run some of our courses remotely, even when we are back on campus, we'll be keeping the interdisciplinary courses um, when we're back on campus. And I think, um, as Dean was saying, we've been able to, especially those of us who teach um, about continents other than North America, have had an amazing opportunity to bring speakers in uh, virtually that we didn't have before. And I so we can, you can be in the classroom and still have a speaker zoomed in from somewhere in the world. And now we have the technology and we have the access. So I think most importantly is to get back and be face to face, but to also take some of the things um, that we've learned that work and that give access to, stu to students and make sure that the students still have access. Thanks so much, Simone. Well, I certainly have learned a lot uh, today and I'm going to let you know right now that I'm gonna steal some of the terrific ideas I've, I've heard from you today. Well, uh, on behalf of the college, I wanna thank you for your time and your expertise in these thought-provoking answers and reflections. And I wanna let uh, those of you tuning in uh, know that we also have a short keynote talk in the program uh, connected to implementing new curricula. The speaker is Dr. Derek Posnikoff, a faculty lecturer in mathematics and statistics and an interdisciplinary scholar. And he'll be speaking about Math 101 and the college's new quantitative reasoning requirement. I hope you get a chance to hear Derek's talk and to take in as many of the other features as you can during this milestone celebration. Well, have a great day, everyone, and uh, a great rest of the term. What the world needs is a better understanding of science. Science underpins everything that we do. And how do you learn to understand and uh, value those things? Uh, it's a BSc. I'm in my third year and I'm majoring in chemistry. Biochemistry and anatomy and cell biology. Physics. Bioinformatics. Biology. Honors. Mathematical physics. With a Bachelor's of Science, you can do pretty much anything you want. And you have such a broad scope of what you can do with your life. Be what the world needs, especially in a time uh, that we're at right now as society. For me personally, it's the most important. Our culture is to always give back, to share your knowledge and what you've learned. It's kind of understanding science in a different way. Applying uh, all the skills that I had learned in classroom for solving real world problems. Trying to figure out what's going on and what's going wrong. Finding things that go together that you would have never really thought about. Saying, hmm, I wonder what happens when I do this. There is a difference between book learning and hands-on learning. You can get research exposure, exposure that's right from your undergrad. A BSc degree here really is intimately connected to what faculty, what researchers are doing really giving students uh, a solid grasp of science, of chemistry and biology and physics and math. They're able to go out in the world and make really informed decisions. To be you know, the hero of the future who cures this or designs that, that opens a world of possibilities, the value of a BSc, in my opinion, really cannot be overstated. Greetings. My name is Derek Posnikoff, and I am a lecturer in the Department of Mathematics and Statistics. It is my distinct privilege to have been invited to contribute to this celebration by speaking to you today about my involvement with the development and deployment of Math 101, the University of Saskatchewan's new quantitative reasoning course. In fall 2020, 
the College of Arts and Science introduced three new requirements to every degree program it offers. An English language writing requirement, an indigenous learning requirement, and a quantitative reasoning requirement. These exciting curricular changes have been over a decade in the making and help ensure our graduates are people who can form and clearly express informed, thoughtful, well-reasoned positions on critical issues that have a bearing on us all, both individually and collectively. In my opinion, through this curriculum renewal, we have taken a significant step towards being what the world desperately needs. The quantitative reasoning requirement arose from a pervasive sense that too many of our students lacked the fundamental quantitative skills necessary for success at the university and in the world at large, and that this skills gap needed to be addressed. Being able to reason effectively about quantitative data is an increasingly important skill in the information age and 21st century Canadian society. To paraphrase mathematician Jordan Ellenberg, the power of mathematical thinking is that it rigorously extends and enhances our common sense to help us not be wrong. The college's new curricular requirements help free our students from avoidable error and malicious manipulation. Communication and quantitative reasoning skills have formed the core of an advanced education since ancient times when the trivium and quadrivium were the standard curriculum. By ensuring that our students receive training in contemporary versions of these liberating arts, we help them become reasonable autonomous citizens and empower them to rise to their potential. Many students in our college satisfy the new quantitative reasoning requirement automatically because their program of study already included a math or statistics course as a requirement before the curriculum change. However, around 700 students per year enroll in programs that did not formerly require such a course. Some of these students will have no problem succeeding in traditional calculus, linear algebra, or probability theory course. However, and I know this comes as a shock to you, many students dislike mathematics and have serious issues that would prevent them from thriving in the existing courses that satisfy the quantitative reasoning requirement. What do these students typically look like? They are enrolled in a degree program for which the requirement to take a quantitative reasoning course is new as of fall 2020. While they have successfully met the admission requirements of the college by completing a grade 12 math course, weaknesses in their fundamental math skills, whatever the cause, make success in the existing courses that satisfy the quantitative reasoning requirement unlikely without extreme effort and dedication. They have feelings about mathematics ranging from ambivalence to extreme negativity. For many of these students, their default reaction to mathematics is anxiety. They do not see the value of additional mathematical study in their own lives. Staying true to our commitment to put students first, it was obvious that a new course was required to meet the needs of this cohort and provide the students in it with an achievable path to degree completion. Two and a half years ago, I was approached by the Quantitative Reasoning Working Group and invited to join the team tasked with developing a new quantitative reasoning course. Our efforts resulted in Math 101, a non-traditional mathematics course with several noteworthy features. Math 101 is based upon the Quantway College system, developed by Carnegie Math Pathways specifically to help students and cohorts like ours complete their degrees. We are the first Canadian institution to join the CMP network. Math 101 requires students to interact with their peers to gain an appreciation for different approaches to reasoning quantitatively and experience with respectfully and constructively collaborating with other people to reach a shared understanding. Active collaboration activities replace traditional passive lectures as the core of the course. Math 101 helps students develop practical strategies for understanding complicated and pertinent real-world issues using basic mathematical concepts and skills introduced in the high school curriculum. Topics considered range from financial matters to social programs to interpreting medical results to ecological concerns. Because every question in the course is rooted in a pressing contemporary issue, the motivation behind the mathematics is never in question. The workload in Math 101 is robust and demanding. Students must complete and submit seven assignments every week. However, the level of abstraction is not as high as in other mathematics courses, and the work is expertly sequenced and scaffolded, making success achievable for all students dedicated to putting in the required effort. Math 101 goes to lengths to reduce the impact of student anxiety on their performance, from integrating information about growth mindset and cognitive reframing into the lessons, to encouraging deliberate self-reflection, to insistence on having only low stakes assessments in the course. Math 101 explicitly aims to help students form a positive personal relationship with mathematics 
encouraging students to find their own unique mathematical voice. I was selected as the instructor for the initial offerings of Math 101 based partly on my interdisciplinary background in mathematics and philosophy. A small pilot section of Math 101 ran successfully in winter 2020, and the first full-fledged offering occurred on schedule in fall 2020. Enrollments lower than the projected maximums have afforded an opportunity to gain some useful experience with implementing the course before needing to run it at full scale. Despite the additional challenges imposed by the COVID-19 pandemic and remote delivery, the first offering of Math 101 was a success. Every student resilient and dedicated enough to stick out the course to the end passed. Perhaps more significantly, student feedback about Math 101 was overwhelmingly positive and spoke to the success of the course design in meeting the varied needs of its target audience. I am proud of what we have accomplished in Math 101 so far, and I look forward to helping this course grow to reach its full potential in the years ahead. Thank you to Dean Bonham-Smith for inviting me to contribute this story to the celebration. Special thanks to my theme team of assistant instructors, to my fellow development team members, and to Vice Dean Debrze and the many members of the Math 101 Steering Committee. Math 101 could not be a success without all of your efforts. Thank you for watching and congratulations to everyone from the College of Arts and Science on surviving and thriving through this challenging second year of our college plan. This This is the sound of all of us. This is the sound of, sound of all of oh. But after Chem 112, you'll always come back to the ideal gas law. Anyway, I wanted you to meet Bernie. She just demanded to be up on my lap now when I want to record. And so she's part of the class now. Surrendering to the mystery. That was bad. So we would want to look instead at what is actually going on with the sedimentary environment here. What is the depositional environment? And so I. Just the sound of all of us. Is the sound of all. The College of Arts and Science allows students to do um, courses both in arts and science and that allows for a very rich background that students don't have at all universities. I am majoring in psychology. I I'm a graduate of English. Honors degree in philosophy with a minor in political studies. I have a Bachelor of Arts honors in regional urban planning. I teach linguistics. I'm a lecturer in the Department of Political Studies and International Studies. You're able to explore different options alongside your major option. It really shapes not just looking from how you want to see the world, but how other disciplines and how other people are seeing the world. You learn to step outside of your comfort zone to think in an abstract way, to learn to form your opinions based on evidence, not based on hearsay. It's not just about learning new things, it's also about uh, identifying yourself in the things you learn. It's so much more than discipline that I'm studying, it's kind of like a, it's become my way of life and my way of thinking and living, which is really important to me. I think the U of S allows students to think outside the box, gives them the skills that they need to be able to work in incredibly different fields. They're going to be able to engage in pushing important things forward, uh, things that are critical like climate change or 
our economy or our political structure. People need idea makers, people to think creatively. Develop something the world has never even thought about before. And I think the Bachelor of Arts provided me with that well-rounded education, so I have a wide variety of transferable skills. The skills that I've gained is being more confident with who I am and using my voice and feeling like I'm not scared to take up space as an Indigenous person, especially as a woman. So I can take the skills that I've learned and I can kind of imagine the different ways that I can apply them to different occupations. And as I progress throughout my degree, I realized that my Bachelor of Arts could get me anywhere. Now I'm giving back now, so I feel great about that. Hello, my name is Hani Constant. I'm one of the student assistants here at the Aboriginal Student Centre. I'm also the Senior Interpretive Guide at Wanuskaman Heritage Park. I'm also currently a master's student here at the University of Saskatchewan getting my Master's of Archaeology. My master's thesis is to create an interpretive program for Wanuskaman Heritage Park. And what that means is I get to create a program or a tour for people to come to the park and learn about the archaeological record at Wanuskaman from an Indigenous perspective. So my master's is to honour all seven Indigenous groups that we acknowledge at the park that we see there for over 6,000 years of a human occupation. And I get to tell their stories of all the amazing things they've done. My name is Ernie Walker. I am a faculty member in the Department of Archaeology and Anthropology and a founder of Wanuskaven Heritage Park. Honey came to my office, I think, is the first time I saw her. She was an undergraduate student. Uh, and expressed some interest in some archaeology classes that I was teaching. She subsequently became a bit of a regular uh, in my office and so she uh, did take more classes with me and finished her undergraduate degree. So we were musing about things after that and she expressed an interest in uh, doing graduate work and she is now my graduate student in her second year. One of my most happiest recollections is how Honey has blossomed. She got involved in a lot of student activity around campus, outside the department, even outside the college. So she uh, gained uh, some confidence I think that was really, really important. So if you contrast that with the very first day that she walked into my office and didn't say very much, um, it has been quite a journey. When we were building Wanuskewin and the First Nations community was trying to figure out whether it was going to be involved or not, this is some 40 years ago. The decision was made that day in 1984 that the First Nations community would be there. One elder told me that the real reason why they were going to join this endeavor was that it was supposed to happen all along. So there are little things for the last 42 years related to Wanuskewin that I sometimes think are sort of minor miracles. Some of them are pretty big miracles. This, this was not supposed to happen um, the way it did. Uh, we're on the verge of a World Heritage designation, perhaps. And I think Honey coming into the program and blossoming the way she did was just another one of those little things that were supposed to happen. It's not scientific, I understand that. But uh, too many things have happened along the way with this project. So the students have been a big part of it. Literally hundreds of undergraduate students Yes, some graduate students, uh, and she is among the very best. I think as Indigenous scholars or students, we often see a lot of different challenges throughout our academic years. Um, so for me, I like to think of the word we'll go to in, which means kinship or all my relations. And it's a teaching that kind of just tells you that you make family out of the people around you. I am at uh, the graduates uh, level in my department and just starting to build that community around me. 
Uh, when you find people that have a like uh, communities and stories, it's just easier to lean on each other. So when I think of uh, my challenges, I think of the people that helped me get through it. Interdisciplinary program is one that allows students to study outside of traditional boundaries and allows students to explore the relationships between disciplines. To problem solve uh, in a way that respects, acknowledges, and um, empowers many different people. There's no single field that will solve all of the grand challenges like climate change or precision medicine or discovering new drugs. I am studying paleobiology, bioinformatics, classical medieval and renaissance studies. I am a PhD candidate in toxicology and I'm also a first year student in the Western College of Veterinary Medicine. And I teach the health studies program. I am a faculty member in women and gender studies. So an interdisciplinary degree, an interdisciplinary program trains us to spot tools everywhere and train us in how to use them. It provides our students the ability to make arguments that resonate broadly across political divides, across political concerns. It is important to know different perspectives, that there's not only our perspective, but many other perspectives. I think it's a prerequisite to deal with the challenges of our lives today. I think the interdisciplinary program has equipped me to be a good problem solver in many ways. The ability to uh, think for yourself, to critically think about what you study, what is around you, I think is the most important thing that you can take out of interdisciplinary studies. I really got to construct my own program. I could actually choose, pick and choose what I really enjoyed. Every year was just shaping me into this different path and I'm really enjoying that. So I find that a focus on interdisciplinarity allows for more students to feel like that their experiences are actually relevant to what we're doing, that they can contribute something valuable. I really appreciate the openness and patience of all the faculty members, always encouraging students to pursue opportunities and make an exciting future for themselves. What the world needs now is creative people. People who can look at the same problems that we're facing and come up with new solutions for them. When you study art, what it gives you is an idea of what it's like to see the world through different people's eyes. It allows people to start conversations, to start talking about topics that they wouldn't have known they should start talking about. Music is the one common language that everyone has. And even if you don't speak the same language, you can always find common grounds with music. So it really allows us to speak beyond what words are capable. Music in and of itself kind of connects to everything else. Drama is important to the shared understanding of the world because it really digs down into the humanity of people and how we're going to learn to treat one another. We learn physically and it, so much of my study during my fine art degree was being given that time to learn uh, through, through my hands. For many students, they actually see their self-esteem increase quite a bit because they get to perform, they have recognition from their peers. They learn uh, how to present their work, how to just collaborate. The process of making in art really is a process of self-discovery. Drama really helped me get me out of my shell. It's like I kind of found out who I was. The skills that I've 
uh, kind of gleaned from my studies would be critical thinking, dealing with the analysis of music. I think one of the greatest things that I gained from studying music here was a sense of dedication. I've learned that I can uh, create things that I never would have thought of before. Being able to spend time here to try different classes out, it, it really gave me the opportunity to then experiment and, and find out that this is the path I wanted to go on. The students that I've had that are gaining employment in the industry that they've trained, it's because they have that BFA. If you love music and you're not quite sure you want to commit all your life to it, um, starting with a music degree can open a whole uh, new set of doors. The combination of creativity and being able to empathize with people, to see through their eyes, are really the problem-solving skills of the 21st century. I'm privileged to be the head of the Department of Music at the University of Saskatchewan. To give you a sense of how we have put our students' needs first during COVID, it might be helpful to give you a brief glimpse into some of our activities before COVID. Our department is a very busy place. Our community is very active on campus with rehearsals and concerts, master classes, applied lessons, and we have many connections that we're very proud of in our department, like our high school select wind orchestra, high school select jazz, our You Sing You Sask program, uh, when our ensembles perform in the community, like at the basement, our music theater performances. We have many opportunities where our students get to work with members of the Saskatoon Symphony Orchestra. Our ensembles go on tours. We normally have many summer activities on our campus in the music area, such as our summer band camps, the Jazz Festival, Jazz Intensive, the Saskatoon Music Festival. And we are literally in the business of bringing people together on and off stage, often shoulder to shoulder. Ours is a highly iterative department where our students in general are learning from each other and supporting and inspiring each other, as well as learning from our faculty in formal and informal ways inside and outside of our classroom and uh, rehearsal structures. So of course many of these traditional uh, modalities of learning and doing music all went out the window because of COVID. So in the spring of 2020 when COVID hit, we asked ourselves this question, what can we do to meaningfully support our student body? One thing we did is we created a, a newsletter and part of that was simply to remind our students and our community who we are, what we are, and why we do what we do. And you can go to our Department of Music website, and if you click on News, our Spring 2020 and Winter 2021 newsletters are there. We created Year in Review ensemble videos for all of our ensembles to help remind students what we were trying to accomplish in those ensembles. Our music education faculty quickly put together a, a very impressive series of guest speakers coming to talk to our students as they're making the transition from our BMAS program into the College of Education's after degree. We took this opportunity to talk a lot about history and context in our virtual ensembles. We did have playing, although it was very difficult to do that because of latency. We did have an opportunity to have our piano majors and our percussion majors come on campus. We created a special once a week virtual meeting opportunity for our entire department to share knowledge and to come together in community as a community. We had a variety of lectures from our Fine Arts Research Lecture Series or FARLs. This included things like the award-winning pianist and composer David Braid talking about do rules help or hinder originality in music? We had a session entitled Confidence, Motivation, and Self-Talk Management for Musicians. 
The wonderful CBC radio producer Tom Allen did an incredible project on being lost. And here Tom focused on the iconic classical composer John Cage and the time that Cage spent here in Saskatchewan in the 1960s at our Kenderdine campus. Dr. Jeanette Glant gave a Farrell's talk on the Huron Carol, the construction of a Canadian cultural icon. We created a faculty and friends virtual concert series. Part of the idea of creating this series was to allow for our students to see their faculty in action. And from this perspective, within learning how to do music at a high level, often examples make the best teachers. On occasion, we were able to include some of our students in that series like the example you see here of undergraduate vocalist Kate Nachilovi. <laughs> series, we had a talk on wellness for musicians. We created a virtual open house. Our department participated in the Saskatchewan Music Conference. We had some of our students present poster sessions on some of the research activity that they're involved in. And the University of Saskatchewan and University of Regina Jazz Ensembles collaborated to put on a virtual collective performance during the Saskatchewan Music Conference. We took the opportunity to dig deep into curricular revision in the fall, and we got an enormous amount of curricular revision done. All of this information is also in our winter 2021 newsletter. We moved all of our additions to virtual, and we were able to improve our scholarship awarding uh, processes to notify students sooner in the year than ever before that they've been admitted and awarded a scholarship. We undertook a significant process to bring certain things back onto campus in a gradiated kind of way. This included bringing our ensembles back on campus, in the month of March, we were able to bring all of our lessons back on campus on all instruments and stream third and fourth year and master's level recitals. And we are also recording those recitals uh, in HD. So each student performing recitals now have a wonderful archival document. In the spring of 2021, we've created a virtual conference entitled Music and Wellbeing. And this is a conference where our keynote speaker will be Dr. Daniel Leviton. We hope you have enjoyed the summary of the activities that we have worked so very hard at to support our wonderful students on our campus. We hope to see you soon. My name is Jennifer Lang and I'm an assistant professor in choral music education here at the University of Saskatchewan. I'm honoured today to speak about a great initiative in the Department of Music that has been an important one for our incoming students or our future Huskies in the U of S PAC. This initiative is our Department Open House. In the past, on any given day, you would find the Department of Music hallways, practice rooms, performance venues filled with talking and laughing and singing and instrumental sounds. It is this energy that we want potential students at the U of S in the music department to see and long to be a part of.
experiences have involved our current faculty and students inviting incoming students into their lessons, classes, rehearsals, master classes, information sessions, student panels, student-led tours of our beautiful campus, and special invitations to our collaborative concert called Play It Forward and the Saskatoon Symphony Orchestra Concert. During Term 1, our hallways were mostly empty, classes were remote on WebEx, ensembles were muted on Zoom, and yet we still wanted incoming students to get a sense of the atmosphere and opportunities when they study here. Clearly, we were not able to open the doors of the department to potential students, so we had to find a way to bring this magic to them. We decided to create a virtual open house and were thrilled to connect with 35 students, ranging from Delisle, Prince Albert, Saskatoon, Humboldt, Kindersley, North Battleford, Rostern, Marengo, and even Winnipeg, Manitoba. Our open house was on a Sunday in December from 1 to 4 p.m and students were encouraged to drop in for the sessions that they wanted. What surprised and delighted the faculty was that all of them stayed throughout all of the scheduled events. We offered sessions on post-secondary music involvement after high school, ensemble information, what you can do at university as a music major, preparing your department music audition application, preparing for the theory placement, a masterclass with their future instructors, scholarship possibilities and processes, and a student session where our student leaders spoke about their experiences and answered questions of the incoming class. Each session contained video and music examples that featured our students and faculty so that incoming students felt welcomed, prepared, and supported right from the very beginning of their studies here at the U of S. Hey everyone, my name is Cameron Breider and I'm the newly elected president of the 2020 to 2021 USMAS Executive. Firstly, welcome to the department. Next term, we plan on hosting a virtual professional development day. This event will include various topics, including leadership, teaching in the modern day classroom, and much more. If you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to us. We are more than happy to help and want to make your music education experience as easy, as smooth, and as fun as possible. Hi there, my name is Anna Kasuku. I wanted to take some time to talk to you about my experience as a student here in the department. What I am most grateful for is being given two things, opportunity and a second family. Although we are online this year, we can still connect with our friends and colleagues, still make music, whether it be solo or collaborating online, and achieve our goals. So that's a little taste for the music department for you. And my experience here as a student has been the best. Now when we are meeting with these incoming students at their auditions, Many of them comment on how personal and welcoming that open house experience was for them. For those who were unable to join us synchronously for our open house, we have embedded these videos on our website so that future students can do a self-guided virtual open house tour. This way, students will always be able to visit us and gain insight into the opportunities at the University of Saskatchewan's Department of Music, where they learn that they can come here and go anywhere. Since it is a Cree word, Gamskeno or Giskinahamagyo, this uh, word actually means to educate or education or just learning. And I really like incorporating a lot of my Cree teachings, my Cree knowledge um, into the program. For me, the work with Kemskino and the Science Ambassador Program is incredibly meaningful on multiple levels. It's been a really wonderful learning experience and just uh, a really fun opportunity to be a part of. Well, I was never much of a public speaker before I started Camps Canal. It's definitely something that you kind of have to jump straight into. I really love it just to see the kids grasp the science and and be amazed at the natural world. It's really rewarding. Some of the kids say um, it, it teaches me science in a practical way. It makes science fun. The energy it brings into the classroom and how it affects not just the kids, but the teachers in the classrooms. This program has been so powerful for me to connect with other people um, across different disciplines and apply my own scientific knowledge and really feeling like I am a part of something. It is a really meaningful experience for me to work 
alongside Erica and represent the Museum of Natural Sciences as I reach out to individuals as well as create content for the museum's website. My working at the museum has opened my eyes a little bit in terms of what I can be doing better as an ally in terms of including content and how to include content. As an Indigenous woman, representation is one of the most important things to me. When I was a student, I didn't often see people who looked like me or Indigenous people within roles in science. I find that there's a lot of underrepresentation in the sciences as a whole, and so me um, being an Indigenous woman in sciences, I feel like is very meaningful. I think one of my favorite parts of working with the Science Ambassador Program is when students will come up to me after a session and get extremely excited about university, asking what steps next to take. The meaning of this program is something that it's difficult to explain because it's, for me, really something that you feel and you experience when you're in it. And those moments when the students kind of all exclaim, wow, or we're going through different pieces of learning Cree language or acknowledging things about protocol and those are things that are like a lived experience that I will take with me beyond the program and into work that I'm doing for the rest of my life. So how it affects us as instructors, bonding with these kids and seeing how much we've affected their lives through this program and how much we've encouraged them to want to take up careers in science. As an elementary school student myself, we'd have people come in with uh, to teach science using different methods and these uh, tangible hands-on out-of-the-book experiences really made me latch on to science in the first place so it's cool to be able to pass that on now to today's kids. I'm in my third year of university now but I was really intimidated as a child and growing up to think I, I would never be you know accepted or successful in those institutions and I you know, over the course of these two years, I think I've developed a lot of confidence. And growing up, th those kind of role models weren't around for me to, to exist. So it's really meaningful to possibly be that f for younger generations. Science was a big part of my life. I really loved science as a, as a little girl um, growing up. And um, it was always my favorite subject. And I feel like um, representation is very important. I myself have been trying to reclaim my language as a Cree and Michif person and by me reclaiming this I'm also able to pass it on to some of those students who may not have those opportunities. One of the best examples of student first um, that I have come across in my university career, I feel that my individuality is uh, celebrated and encouraged and it's really refreshing to be working in uh, an academic realm that also celebrates my artistry and my opinions and my voice. And I feel like we really know each other in the program. I've gained a diverse set of skills that I originally never thought I would have in terms of programming, in terms of writing up content that can be shared. I love it. I love being able to help educate the children of tomorrow and the people of today. Seeing how much I've grown since I started this experience, I really appreciate the impact it's had on my self-worth. Being very reciprocal and very beneficial in mutual ways. We have participated in culture camps where we learned a lot of that traditional land-based knowledge. So giving this opportunity to science ambassadors who often don't have the ability to go hunting or trapping or to learn how to pick medicines, the Science Ambassador Program allows us to bridge these connections. I've definitely learned a lot about myself and lots of um, job skills, like, you know, what it means to be a part of a team, like to work together and to communi communicate with each other so that we can create a positive learning experience for students. It's a really fruitful position. It's a fantastic place to work. The people that I work with are always so helpful and straightforward and interesting. I'm given practical experiences to be inside classrooms this year virtually and to learn uh, classroom management and leadership skills. Since taking on the role of virtual content creation, I have gained that self-confidence to reach out to people for 
even the littlest of questions or asks. We definitely work with people of many different backgrounds, many different um, STEM fields or educational fields, and I think it's important that um, we learn how to work together and learn from each other. One of the absolute highlights is the fact that there's so much from this program that I feel that I will take with me even after I graduate. I will take elements of the cultural teachings, I will take friendships, I will take in-classroom hands-on learning experiences for myself as a teacher, and it's really an honor to get to work in a program like that. You're just changing the lives and improving the lives of thousands and thousands of kids here in Saskatoon and Saskatchewan as a whole. Everything that we do with Camps Canal is trying to help others, trying to make this world a better place. When the programs are ending, are the most saddening period for us as instructors and also for the kids because we just don't want it to end. Nobody wants it to end because of the energy and the fun and the learning. I wouldn't, I, this is my favorite job I've ever had. It's, it is, I'm not gonna lie. I, I, I wish I could do this job forever. It's just it's so fun. Welcome everyone. My name is Levina and I'm the manager of study abroad and interdisciplinary programs here in the College of Arts and Science. And I'm also a member of the College Plan Advisory Committee, which helped put this day together. So today we're here to celebrate the College 2025 plan, Think Big, Be Bold. And this plan isn't just words, right guys? It's a promise. This day is really about reflecting on what we've done and what was innovative and inspiring and new. So a lot of great things have happened this year, in addition to a lot of not so great things that have happened this year. Um, we've also been able to see some truly positive events come out of this and a lot were completely unexpected and perhaps for the better. And for example, this year, during the middle of a pandemic, we launched a new learning community called Level Up and it's for second year students. The only one on campus and it's already really successful, it's awesome. Um, we launched a new course called New Math for Real Life, Math 101. I think a couple of us here have actually taken the class, highly recommended. And it's for a, a math class for non-science students. So definitely, definitely check it out. Um, and we had our orientation this year virtually. And this is significant because we had record high attendance with this online format. So this is a great example of how things have changed, but perhaps for the better, as we look at incorporating um, some of these things in our planning for student events in the future. So students have experienced a lot of difficulties, right? And as a result of going to this virtual platform and some students have really benefited. So I'm excited about this panel because we have three arts and science students here. Everybody wave. <laughs> do the same way, um, to share what their experiences are and have been and what they've gone through over the last couple terms and to chat about the good and the bad and hopefully some of the ugly just to get it out there um, so before we get too far let's meet everybody so uh who wants to go first Palak? yeah um so my name is Palak. Uh, my pronouns are she her um i'm the president of the assu this year and I'm also in my third year of physiology and pharmacology. Um, so yeah, I'll pass it on to Lucas because he's below me right now. <laughs> Hi everyone, my name's Lucas. I'm a second year computer science major, math and physics minors, and I'm currently the vice president of internal affairs for DSSU. Tiana, would you like to go next? Hello, good day and greetings everybody. Um, my name is Tiana Sanguis and I am in my first year of studying psychology. Um, I don't have any titles under my belt just yet, but you know, hopefully um, engaging more in this online platform and having the opportunities that I wouldn't have otherwise been a bit shy to have. <laughs> <laughs> Cool. So let's start about chatting about some of the opportunities that have come out of this for you guys or that you didn't expect or that you don't think you could have done before 
Alec, weren't you saying that you were now, even though it's not part of the university, but you are now able to shadow doctors? What was that? Um, about? Yeah, so um, I found like an online website and I know there's a few floating around this year, but um, it kind of gave me the opportunity to shadow a bunch of doctors online, which sounds like, what are you really like shadowing if it's online? But like, they'll take us through like a typical day um, in their clinic and they'll talk about like, uh, what it's like to be in their position and that's just something I don't think I would have been able to do if I if it wasn't for the pandemic uh, just because it's really hard to always find like a doctor to shadow and um, time constraints and like working it out with that doctor and then working it with my schedule as well so that's one thing that um, I'm really happy came out of the pandemic uh, but I know like even in the ASSU um, there's a lot of things that we were able to do like I've been able to go to like most of the events and um I know me and Lucas really got close this year because it was online and we were able to see each other more often because I know last year it'd be hard for me to like go sit in the office for like a whole day with like a bunch of classes and things coming around but now like I'll just jump into like a study night and hang out there for an hour get to know everyone there and then leave and it'll really just fit into my schedule I think Lucas can talk more about that too though yeah, definitely being able to jump between events was something good. But also, I think that most importantly, the benefit was to learn more about myself and what works for my schedule and for my well-being. So that was a, an opportunity that I didn't have before. Oh, that's fantastic. Yeah, so well-being, we all have to keep our eyes on that, hey, don't we? Um, so in the past, we had students who were unable to do a lot of the things you guys have just mentioned, like uh, participate in certain classes or student groups or go on exchange or, or even be in one of those learning communities that we are so good at here in arts and science, um, but are now to do, being able to do these things because they are virtual. Like Tiana, can you, you participate in the Indigenous Student Achievement Pathway, right? Yes, can you, it has been. Can you share what, how that went for you online? Certainly, it's been super duper detrimental in my integrating into university life, you know, um, creating those social relationships with everybody. Like my first semester, too scared to turn on my camera, too scared to like ask anybody if, you know, like we could be friends on Instagram or, you know, like <laughs> meet up, have those study sessions. But um, through Math 101, actually, I had a partner and through the ISAP, they offered a smaller cohort. And so the Math 101 is super unique in how it offers, offers its curriculum and um, everything. But through that, that was like my first really, really good friend that I made. And he was also in the ISAP um, community. So I see him in a couple of my other classes that I have now. But, you know, having that smaller cohort and the Math 101 was amazing. <laughs> and as well as like the weekly tutorials that they have. And like, it's so um, intimidating to turn on your camera. But like, trust me, it like helps to build those relationships and those connections. And it's not as scary as it seems because everybody is like just as nervous as you are. <laughs> That's right. I mean, you forget that, you know, everybody is in the same situation. And mm -hmm. you're right. I would have kept my camera off until one of the profs said, no, everybody turn them on. <laughs> <laughs> but the, I mean, you're right. You're so right about the whole integrating into university life. Like you haven't even been on campus yet. Your whole experience has been <laughs> online. So you might be ahead of the game a bit, huh? Yeah, well, that's a little bit, a little bit. <laughs> um, I've learned to create better study habits and, you know, not like I hear Palak and um, Lucas talking about like studying at the library, you know, but not actually mm -hmm. studying. So I like I haven't had that yet. I do know that they um, they offer a virtual TMC um, the Trish Monteur Center online, which is really great too, something through ISAP. Um, you know, it's kind of um, changed to the online platform of being able to hang out at the library and such, but um, I am super excited to be able to return to campus. Um, although this pandemic has been super beneficial in putting academics first. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. I go, see, I never thought of it like that, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, um, definitely. That's uh, adapting like a, a growth over like a fixed mindset. You know, like that's something that I definitely had to learn too is um, seeing how the, the 
pandemic negatively impacted my studies versus like positively impacting. So it's all about mindset. <laughs> right. <laughs> and, and it's so possible for those who were not able to travel to campus um, or who had family commitments or jobs after class. And, you know, and our classes are now full with people from all over the city and the province and some cases the world. Like for example, Lucas, where are you right now? I'm in Brazil. Right. <laughs> this is so cool. Um, and how has that been difficult for you or just fine? How was your experience with being in another country during your classes? Well, my transition has been pretty all right. Actually, as my 8.30 class starts at like 12.30 for me and the assignments that are due at like midnight, I have until 3 a.m. to hand in. So, you know, it's super chill. Oh, wow. Okay, cheating. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, not cheating, but you know, sleeping in is not a bad thing. Um, did anyone help? So, does anyone have any funny stories from us from any of their classes that just kind of randomly happen? Like, for example, the class that I took in the summer, um, people weren't really sure about the chat section, like that the prof or the instructor can actually see that too. Um, so, a lot of learning curves had to be met. <laughs> Um, but that was just funny until somebody realized that, you know, somebody else can see that. It's not just that. Anybody? I mean, I don't, for me, like, I haven't had anything like that because I'll be really scared about like muting and unmuting and like making sure my camera's off. Like I have a special sticker that can slide over because like, even if it says that your camera's off, I'm like, I don't know. I don't know if I trust that. What if there's a glitch? And like, <laughs> I've been really like particular about that, but I haven't seen anyone mess anything up like that so far yet. I don't know about you guys. The great thing is part of this day, there's a bloopers reel that we can all check out that happened in classes and with profs that put, you know, pets and kids and it's been fantastic. But anyway, uh, so I am, I just want to say that I'm so thankful for all of you for participating in this. And, and I'm so proud to be part of a group of staff and faculty who have been able to recreate themselves and their courses and provide some crucial, crucial supports to our students. And, you know, we've been able to think bigger and be bolder than we ever thought possible. So thank you all again for spending some time with me. And I look forward to doing this again next year. Yeah, thank you so much. Thanks. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>
this year using our new robotic telescope located out at Sleaford Observatory. And uh, I am here with Rena Rast, who's a, a fourth year uh, astronomy physics student who's who's doing a capstone project in astronomy this year using the Prompt USASC telescope that's out at Sleaford. And uh, I'm going to open up the, the roll-off roof enclosure that the telescope is in. There it is. And uh, Rena's going to tell us about her project. Right, so my project is focused on verifying the classifications of bright stars um, in catalogs that resulted from all sky surveys. And this is important because a lot of these objects are novel detections, there's lack of data which corroborate their classification. So what I'm doing is I'm using the Prompt USAS telescope to take images on objects that need follow-up observations so that I can verify their classifications or if they're wrong, um, reclassify them correctly. Thanks, Rena. All right, so uh, the the roof is is getting close to open here. We can see the telescope has, has shown up. This window right here is actually, uh, I'm using AnyDesk to connect to the computer that's out there that runs the roof and runs the telescope, runs the camera, and all of the equipment out there. So the, the camera, or the computer is actually located in this, uh, in this cabinet right there. Uh, so using the computer, I can uh, click on this star chart anywhere on it and tell the telescope where I want it to go. The telescope has a, a pointing accuracy of about, uh, about 0 0.01 degrees, and the field of view of the camera, which is operated over here, is, uh, is a sixth of a degree, roughly across. And so because of this, because the, tele the, the mount points the telescope so accurately, um, oh, it's frozen up waiting for that image to come back, because it points so accurately, we're actually able to run this telescope completely automated uh, so that a person doesn't have to go on to the, the computer uh, with the frozen connection <laughs> and, uh, and, and tell it to move around. It, it's able to connect to a, a robotic telescope network called Skynet, um, named after the Terminator movies. And, uh, and, and Skynet runs the, the telescopes completely on their own. Right, so doing that uh, means that students are able to operate the telescope from their homes using just an internet connection and a web browser because Skynet's operated all on the web. Uh, they can schedule their observations at different sky coordinates uh, using different, uh, different filters, like I was using the H-alpha filter for this image that I took of the sky, um, and, and point the telescope to different parts of the sky, giving various constraints. And Rena's actually going to show us that on her computer right now. Okay. So this is the form that the Skynet uh, Robotic Telescope Network uses uh, to submit observations. So I'm just gonna input the name of a galaxy here because it's really handy. You can just search um, Messier objects, I think NGC objects as well. Alternatively, you could have put in the right ascension or declination, uh, but that's the galaxy I wanna schedule images on. I can set, um, this little box here, which basically says the sun has to be at least this low in the sky before you take images. It has to do with how dark the sky is going to be when it's taking images. Minimum target elevation has to do with image quality when images are really low in the sky. A lot of times your data quality isn't great. Uh, I'm setting it so the moon is at least 30 degrees for my object, so I'm not getting moonlight contaminating my images. You can scroll down and you can see so many telescopes here that can be imaging M51. Uh, so I'm just going to save and choose a telescope. And again, the whole list of ones that I could look at, uh, ones in Alberta, bunch in the US, and, and I'm just gonna pick Prompt USASC. Um, and there's a whole list of filters I could pick as well. There's ones that are used mostly for science imaging, so ones that I've been using for my project and also ones used for astrophotography. So I'm just gonna do uh, red, green, blue, luminance, and also H-alpha. 
Save and continue, and this page is where you can choose how many exposures you want in each filter, and also how long those uh, exposures would be. And it shows me the total amount of time that's going to use up on the telescope, how many credits are going to be needed. I can pick which account I'm going to be pulling those credits from. Uh, this repeat observation is really helpful for doing things like my project where I'm imaging the same uh, object repeatedly over a given amount of time. Once I save and continue, I end up with a page sort of confirming everything that I just put in. And once I say submit, then it's going to be in the queue and the telescope just waiting for it to get dark. And then we'll be able to take those images and I'm going to check back in a bit. Great. Okay. Thanks, Rena, for showing us how we use Skynet and, and access our telescope and how other people around the world access our telescope at Sleaford um, using the Skynet website. Uh, we're going to sign off now and, uh, and come on later at night. It's daytime now, so we can't do astronomy. We have to wait for nighttime and show how the telescope works behind the scenes. All right, so it's nighttime, and Rena and I are back <laughs> to show off the telescope working at night. So you can see here uh, that um, this Terminator app that runs the telescope from Skynet's website, it's uh, currently taking in exposure. This will be a, a picture of a galaxy. There's a, a picture of a galaxy sitting right there, and so it's actually going around taking uh images of galaxies for a, a research group that's uh, doing a supernova search project. And then we're going to pop the telescope into manual mode, and uh, Rena and I are going to take some pictures of, uh, of some other objects here just to, just to show it off. So where do you want to go first? Uh, I was thinking M101, uh, the pinwheel. It's just a really nice uh, spiral galaxy that's based on. It's really big. <laughs> Let's try another a 45 second image of that. Um, nice. That's really nice. Rena, for uh, for the tour of the galaxies. It's fun. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for attending our second annual Think Big, Be Bold Plan milestone celebration in the College of Arts and Science. My name is Dr. Joanne Liao, and I'm an assistant professor in the Department of English. I'm also a member of our College Plan Advisory Committee. As you just saw, we have had many successes this year to celebrate in spite of challenging conditions. We will be submitting this YouTube published broadcast to the University of Saskatchewan COVID-19 Community Archive. Our actions will now be part of the historical record. The pandemic has been a difficult time for so many of our students, staff, faculty, and their families. We want you to know that we see you and how you have found new and innovative ways to think big and be bold in the face of this adversity. How in spite of physical isolation, you have still reached out to care for one another. In doing so, you have continued to make important contributions to our students and their learning experience, showing the ongoing significance of two of our college plan commitments, students first and new curricula. As Dean Peter Bottom-Smith has said, 
Thank you for all for being part of our story. Take care, everyone.